Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 92 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabolsky, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. One of the most difficult aspects of the Middle Ages to pin down, as it were, is also one of the most profoundly influential aspects of human life. Clothing. What we wear affects everything from comfort to health to identity to economy. Maddeningly, though, medieval clothing rarely survives intact because of the nature of its fibers. So how do we trace the medieval clothing and fashion industry? One way is to look at a central figure in the manufacture and distribution of fabric, the medieval clothier. This week, I spoke with Dr. John S. Lee about clothing and clothiers and what they can tell us about the medieval world. John is a research associate at the Center for Medieval Studies at the University of York and the author of The Medieval Clothier, as well as other books on medieval Cambridge and on commemoration, including Compassionate Capitalism, Business and Community in Medieval England, which he co-authored. Here's our conversation on how the medieval cloth-making industry actually worked, the massive technological and economic changes that occurred in cloth-making over the medieval period, and how the world of the clothier was not unlike a medieval Silicon Valley. Well, thank you, John, for joining me to talk about the medieval clothier. This is one of my favorite books that I've read in the past few years, so I am super excited to have you on the podcast. Thank you very much. It's great to be with you. Thank you. Okay, so let's start with what is a medieval clothier? What is that actual job? Well, a clothier was a man or occasionally a woman who was engaged in the making and marketing of cloth. So it wasn't usually someone who actually made clothes. That was the role of a tailor. It was someone who made cloth, usually woolen cloth, and often organised the production if they didn't actually carry out all the processes themselves. And what we also find in the later Middle Ages are that several clothiers became very wealthy entrepreneurs, and they've even been identified by some historians as early capitalists. Yeah, I do want to come back to entrepreneurship later, but I think that for most of us, we don't really appreciate how much effort and how many discrete jobs there were in creating broadcloth, which is the will that you're talking about. So can you give us kind of a rundown of how broadcloth was made in the Middle Ages? Mm, yes, yeah, certainly. So the, the first task was to source the wool, and wool came in um, many different quantities and qualities, and it was the clothier's job to uh, source the wool of appropriate quality that he required. And the wool then had to be sorted and various impurities removed from the fleece. And the fleeces were then carefully uh, washed and cleaned. The fleeces were then either combed or carded. And that was straightening the fibres and again separating out any dirt and impurities that were still in the wool. The wool was then spun into yarn. And that could be done either with a handheld spindle and a distaff or with a spinning wheel. And once the yarn had been spun, it was then woven on a loom into um, the fabric. And the cloth was then fulled. And fulled was a process that basically scoured the cloth. Again, it removed any impurities um, and it also thickened the cloth. Initially, that was done uh, by pounding it with your feet. But increasingly in the Middle Ages, it was mechanised through fulling mills, water-powered mills that powered giant hammers that pounded the cloth and had the same effect as someone's feet. Once the cloth had been fulled, it was then um, hung out um, to dry and to straighten and stretch on tenter hooks, on tenter frames um, outside and then various finishing processes. These included what was known as um, raising the nap. So the cloth was brushed uh, several times with a frame usually containing teasels, and this brought up the fibres that were then sheared off, um, and this process was repeated several times. The cloth was then carefully pressed and folded. And at some point along that process too, the cloth may well have been dyed, now, dyeing could take place in the wool itself. We get the term dyed in the wool from that. Or the yarn could be dyed. 
or the cloth after it had been woven could be dyed too. And the dyeing process required expensive dye stuffs, often imported from overseas, and alum, which was used as a mordant to, to set the dye. So I think when you picture this, <laughs> this is a really long process. So if you had to do this kind of by yourself or in a small family or community, how long would that take, do you think? Yeah, well, it's been estimated about half a year, just under half a year, if you were carrying out all those processes yourself, which, as you say, is an incredibly long period of time. So um, what was increasingly done was that people specialised in different aspects of this process. And it was the clothier's role to coordinate that production, to bring it all together and um, basically pass the raw or semi-finished materials from one of these producers to another. So the clothier um, would purchase the wool and then he would pass that to the carder or comber and then take that to the uh, spinner and then take the yarn to the weaver and then take the cloth to the fuller uh, and to the dyer and so forth. So he would be overseeing that whole process. Yeah, and that's increasingly important, I think, as time goes on to coordinate all those people when you're starting to, well, you're trying to make a business where you're creating more than just one sheet of broadcloth. You have to coordinate all these things. And you mentioned the idea of entrepreneurship. That's not really a word that we tend to apply to the Middle Ages. I think there's this idea that everybody is a serf, and so there's no business outside of maybe a trade. So how is this entrepreneurship kind of as we think of it today? It's got a number of similarities really to how we might think of entrepreneurship today. I think one of the key skills that the clothier needed to have was organisational. So he needed to make sure that all those different production processes were moving correctly, that he had to ensure that the quality control was there so that the finished cloth was of a, of a suitable quality. He often had to provide the capital as well. He might provide the looms that the weavers used. He might fund the equipment for fulling and dyeing. And he would purchase the raw materials that he would supply to his workers too. And um, the clothiers usually operate a system that's known as the domestic system, a system of outworking, where all these different cloth workers are usually working in their own homes. And it's a little bit like a modern uh, gig economy, if you like, because uh, these people are working in their own homes, usually on piece rates. So they're only paid for what they actually produce and they have to uh, undertake it within the, the timescales that the clothier wants. But they're free to do that whenever they wish within those timescales. And they often combine that work with other work around the home or agricultural work or other craft work, too. And the clothier is also an entrepreneur because he's got to market his cloth. He's got to find markets for it. And the medieval clothiers had a number of different outlets for their cloth. They could take it to markets in the local town. But increasingly, many of them are engaging with London merchants. London is the leading centre for cloth exports in England. And an increasing amount of exports are going through the port of London. So Clothier is engaging with London merchants and also sometimes with overseas merchants too to sell their cloth. And finally, the Clothier has also got to organise the credit to make sure that he's got enough cash to keep his business operating. And that's a really tricky business because he has to um, uh, pay for his raw materials and he has to pay his workers and he'll get the cash from the people that he's selling his cloth to. To make his a product as attractive as he can to uh, would-be purchasers, he often sells on credit. So he's not asking for the cash up front, but he's collecting payment uh, maybe six months, 12 months later or so. So he's got to organise that side of things. And then he also tries to obtain his raw materials on credit and delay paying his workers too. So he's always constantly thinking about managing his cash flow, a bit like a modern entrepreneur would do. <laughs> yes. And you were mentioning in the book that one of the things that makes it possible for them to create enough or gather enough capital in order to create this credit and, and start to subcontract things, it's kind of a function of the Black Death. And I, I think it's worth 
talking about this now because everyone is thinking about COVID-19 and the Black Death and what the economy might look like differently. So how did the Black Death make it possible for the clothier to actually become a position that people had? Well, I guess that the, the fundamental thing that the Black Death did was change the balance of the, the population. It reduced the population in England probably by about half. And that meant that there was a lot more land available and labour was much more scarce. So people generally enjoyed higher living standards after the Black Death because they could earn more for their labour and they could farm larger portions of land. So there are rising living standards generally among the population and that means that there's a greater market for cloth. People increasingly want to buy cloth of better quality rather than putting up with uh, some homespun cloth that they might produce themselves. They want some attractive coloured cloth. And in fact, we get commentators after the Black Death really being quite um, critical and dismissive of the lower orders of society, like the peasants who are dressing very finely and really above their station, some of these uh, social commentators think. So there's a demand there after the Black Death. It also enables certain craftsmen, certain farmers to build up capital and and land holding. And some of them employ that in setting up cloth making businesses. So I think that um, the origins of the clothier are there too, that they are establishing uh, cloth making businesses using spare capital that they're able to build up and um, engaging workers that are available. There are also more sheep being grazed too after the Black Death because there's a big move from arable to pastoral farming with fewer mouths to feed. There's less demand for grain and people move over to sheep farming. It's easier. It doesn't require as much labour. You don't need as many people cultivating the field. So, so more sheep are grazing and there's more wool available too as the clover's main raw material. Yes, that was one of the things that actually surprised me about the book. I had an awareness of the wool trade in London being, you know, especially huge. But you mentioned that the clothiers work and the cloth making, it starts to move outwards from the cities. It starts to be a rural thing. And you actually mentioned it's kind of like there's some areas are kind of like a Silicon Valley for cloth making. So why is it moving out of the cities, the cloth making industry? Well, I think there's a number of reasons for that. One of the reasons is that there's there's capital available, as I said, in the countryside uh, from the profits of farming and, and craft work after Black Death. Some of the urban industries are becoming quite restrictive. There's a lot of controls that guilds and town uh, governments place on cloth making. It's also quite expensive living in a town. You've got to pay for the upkeep of things like marketplaces, streets, city walls the civic government and all those trimmings that go with living in a medieval town, you don't have to do that in the countryside. So so your overheads are much lower and you don't have guilds controlling the hours that you work or the wages that you're going to pay people. So there's certainly those factors at work. I think also, too, because um, London merchants are becoming uh, much more dominant in the economy and controlling much more of the cloth exports, they're making links directly with people in the countryside outside these larger provincial towns. They're going directly to these rural clothiers. So there's that factor there too. Yeah, and there was, um, I'm not sure which decade it was in, but the conflict with the Flemings really, I think, made it so that people were increasingly, if we're talking about England, looking towards their own rural wool supply. Is that right? It is, yes. So the wool supplies have been exported uh, to continental Europe, particularly to um, the Low Countries and Flanders over the course of the, uh, the 14th century. But increasingly, more wool is being converted into cloth in England rather than overseas. And as you say, there are conflicts in Flanders and parts of the Low Countries which disrupt the industries there. And the English crown is also taxing very heavily wool exports that are flowing out of England. So it's a lot cheaper for clothiers based in England to produce cloth from raw English wool than it is for their counterparts on the continent to do the same using English wool. Right. And another aspect I think that is important about the increasingly rural aspect 
of the cloth making industry is it's easier to source people, as you say, for the gig economy. And this actually becomes kind of a respectable way for women to earn a living. So can you tell us a little bit about the role of women in cloth making at this time? Yes, certainly. Uh, Women are involved very heavily in cloth making. A lot of the activities that take place, particularly carding and combing and spinning, are very much associated with work that uh, women would carry out, often combining it with childcare, housework, farm work as well. These are activities that they can undertake that require very little capital and that can be combined with other activities too. We also find women helping their husbands as as clothiers with their businesses and supporting them. We find out most about them, actually, after the clothier has died, when we find several widows continuing their husband's business and supplying London merchants with cloth, continuing orders and relationships that had been in place when the husbands had been alive. It seems like the type of industry, perhaps more than other ones, where a woman's contribution in telling her husband about the ins and outs of cloth making might be actually very valuable, I would think. I'm sure it would be, yes. Yeah. And, um, you know, that the term spinster, which survived for many centuries after, comes originally just from a woman who spun wool. So, yes, it's very much uh, associated with the work of both women as well as men. And when I think about what you're saying about combining this and this gig economy, combining it with the domestic work that's being done at home, one of the things that you mentioned in the book is one of the longest processes is the carding and the combing of the wool. And this is something that you could actually get your children to do as well, isn't it? (laughs) So, you know, it's working from home and making extra money on the side, putting the kids to work as well, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, the whole family uh, would frequently be engaged as as soon as children were old enough to do. I'm sure that they would be helping out their uh, mothers and uh, and fathers in the uh, the cloth working. Yes. So one of the things I think that is striking about the clothing or cloth making industry is that technologically the changes over the course of the Middle Ages are immense. And I don't think people realize just how immense these changes were. So at the beginning of the Middle Ages, you're using a drop spindle and the staff and you're you're using a vertical loom. What does it look like at the end of Middle Ages? What does the cloth making industry look like at the end? Okay, well, there's three main changes. The first, as you say, is in spinning. So moving from the drop spindle to the spinning wheel. That was a spinning wheel that was powered by hand, usually known as a great wheel or, or the walking wheel. So it involved quite a lot of walking up and down. The, uh, the pedal-powered spinning wheel tends to appear a little bit later in, in the 16th century. Not all spinning is undertaken with the spinning wheel. It's still thought that some of the um, hand spinning is used particularly, I think, for particularly fine yarn. But that's that's an important innovation, which probably increases productivity by about a third. The second important innovation is moving from the vertical to the horizontal loom. And the horizontal loom could either be a narrow loom that one person operated or a wider loom that was operated by two people. Again, probably increases productivity by about a third. And the third major innovation was the mechanisation of the fulling process. So fulling, which had previously been undertaken by pounding a cloth by foot, and probably quite an unpleasant process because uh, it usually involved stale urine. Um, <laughs> and um, also fuller's earth were put in this uh, vat and then it was pounded underfoot, a little bit like uh, grapes are pressed into wine <laughs> traditionally. And um, that was replaced by the fulling mill. And the fulling mill water-powered wheel powering two large hammers that pounded the cloth. And again, a productivity improvement that probably increased on average by about a third productivity. Yeah. And when you add all of those thirds together, it ends up being quite a change in how quickly you could put cloth out, doesn't it? Absolutely, yes. But as well as those technological changes, I think that the organisational change that the clothier brought in terms of organising this production more efficiently was really revolutionary. And it's that, I think, particularly, that is the key innovation that we see after the Black Death. Do you find that that organisational innovation is something that 
you've seen bleeds over from the clothier's job to other jobs? Like, do you see it as having kind of originated in that clothier's organization and has spilled over into other trades? I think that's difficult uh, to see, to be honest. I am not not sure I can particularly see that. Certainly, the origin of of the clothier organising the production in this way is probably there earlier in terms of merchants in towns are beginning to organise aspects of cloth making in this way. But no, in terms of moving into other industries, I'm, I'm not sure about that. It's a tricky question to ask a specialist, right? Like, tell me about other specialties. <laughs> but that's okay. I can steer us into safer waters because I do have a question. You're talking about fulling mills and the clothing industry, a huge industry in England, as we're saying, it shaped the environment as well. So can you tell us a little bit about how the clothing industry encourage people to change their actual environments in which they're living? The cloth industry changes the environment in a number of ways. The fulling mills that appear up and down the country, water courses are diverted to provide water for those fulling mills, but also for washing wool and for dyeing cloth. Houses are built for clothiers and also for cloth workers. And churches are endowed, providing ambitious rebuilding of of churches and very lavish memorials to clothiers. Yes, well, I think that all of these things are going to make a big difference, especially in these towns that are building up around the cloth industry. One of the things that you mentioned is that people are building houses for clothiers or they're building places kind of like factories for people to work in. And you mentioned in the book a few very wealthy clothiers. So can you give us an idea of what it could be like for a very successful clothier and how the community viewed these people? Yeah, I mean, the the very wealthiest clothiers are fascinating because they're real, literally, uh, rags to riches stories, really, that uh, people that in the space of one or two generations are rising from really humble origins to the ranks of the gentry and in some cases possibly even mixing with kings. It's uh, an incredible story. So we get people like the Springs of Lavenham, three generations of clothiers based in Lavenham in Suffolk. And the first spring, Thomas Spring, probably comes from a county Durham and um, he's a a grazier and um, starts cloth making industry in uh, Lavenham. It's expanded significantly by his son, Thomas II, who leaves very large legacies in his will to his cloth workers. He may have been employing several hundred cloth workers based on the amount of the legacies that he leaves. And then his son, Thomas III Spring, gains uh, a coat of arms. He acquires many lambs and manors across Suffolk and beyond and holds many positions in the county government, justice of the peace, member of parliament and so forth. So a really wealthy clothier who even attracts the comments of John Skelton in one of his poems. He writes of rich spring of Lavenham, the, the clothier. So these people, once they get to the top, they are contributing to the community. So do you feel that they are loved by the community or is that a sense that you don't get from the sources? It's very difficult to unpick that, really. They're certainly contributing to the community. They're leaving very substantial bequests in their wills to be remembered after their deaths, often leaving charitable donations to support the poor maybe found arms houses, schools, uh, certainly endowed churches and have masses said after their wills, uh, after their death, sorry. So they're certainly leaving a large number of charitable bequests. On the other hand, we do find evidence of complaints against uh, some of the wealthier clothiers that they are not paying their cloth workers in ready money They're often deferring payments for long periods of time, too. And we also find one or two specific accusations against uh, some of the leading clothiers of improper behaviour that perhaps they'd embezzled an inheritance 
or they'd coerced uh, tenants off lands or behaved in, in some other inappropriate way. Now, it's very difficult to get to the bottom of those accusations because they were legal accusations that were put forward by others. But uh, certainly some people resented the wealth that um, they had accumulated. Yes, I think you were mentioning in the book that there was a movement to create a statue of one of these clothiers in his hometown, and people were not all that excited about it in the modern age. Yes, that's right. In um, in Newbury, in uh, Berkshire, there have been proposals to um, erect a statue to John Winchcombe the second, also known as Jack of Newbury, who was a leading clothier in the, the Tudor period, who is thought to have brought together all his workers in a centralised um, workshop, possibly an early factory, if you like. And uh, yes, that's really uh, rather divided the community, that there's some in favour of that and others that uh, see him as a bit of a sort of Tudor fat cat, and, <laughs> uh, not really very in favour. John Winchcombe II also uh, has somewhat blotted his copybook in terms of some modern commentators because he was in favour of the burning of, of some heretics in the 1550s too. And um, that, again, is uh, as understandably um, generated criticism. Yes, well, I think that's fair enough. But it's funny how when you think about entrepreneurship these days, it's kind of the same thing where people are very excited about entrepreneurs as long as they don't get too big. <laughs> when they get very big, then they're not cool anymore. <laughs> I'm thinking, of course, of people like Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, right? As soon as you get to be big, then all of a sudden you are, you are not moral anymore. And the subject of conspiracy theory, which I think is probably possible in the Middle Ages too. <laughs> I'm sure it is, yes. So you were talking about some of these people are rubbing elbows with royalty and things, and it made me wonder, have you found evidence of certain royal figures that have a, a favorite clothier, like a favorite cloth maker that they that they go to regularly for their clothes? Not quite as specific as that. The the evidence that we've got that they had royal connections is quite patchy. But what we do find is that John Winchcombe of Newbury is supplying a large amount of curses, a particular type of, of narrow cloth, with a particular type of weave, um, onto the, um, the foreign market, particularly to Antwerp. And Thomas Cromwell, one of um, Henry VIII's leading ministers, is very keen to secure stocks of Winchcombe's curses. And he's writing to um, John Winchcombe um, at one point about that. We also find that Thomas Spring, the third of Lavenham, his widow commissions a very ornate screen around his tomb in Lavenham Church, which is known as Parklow's Screen. And it does seem as if royal craftsmen may well have been employed in producing that screen because there's some important stylistic similarities between that screen in Lavenham Church and work that we know that royal craftsmen undertook in Westminster Abbey and St George's Church, uh, Windsor. And there's um, evidence for uh, William Stump of Malmesbury in Wiltshire, another leading clothier. There's a room in uh, his house, Abbey House at Malmesbury, that's known as the Banqueting Room. And um, legend has it that uh, Henry VIII uh, once called by and uh, dined in, in that room. Although I don't think that there's any uh, documentary evidence to support that one. <laughs> that's okay it's enough that there is a room called the banqueting room i think i'm going to name a room in my house that <laughs> just keep keep that name because that's great well i was thinking about how you're saying even though it's hard to trace that evidence perhaps that's something that happened i was thinking about trade secrets and especially with dyeing i would think i mean weaving also you could have a proprietary pattern that you don't want people to copy but i would think with dyeing especially that kind of chemical formula you might want to protect. I'm not sure if that would be something that would show up in the evidence. Would that be something that you've come across? It's very difficult, as you say, to find it in the evidence, but I'm sure that would be the case because dyeing is such a skilled occupation. It requires very expensive dye stuffs, often imported from abroad, 
And there's the potential to make some very expensive mistakes if you get dying wrong. You can waste <laughs> some really expensive materials and you can ruin a really um, good piece of quality cloth that you might have spent a lot of time getting ready. So I think dying really was the most important skill. And yes, I think there were many trade secrets that were probably passed from father to son. And uh, part of the uh, apprenticeship of many clothiers would be to learn and the art of dying. I was thinking about this in terms of, as we're saying, there are lots of discrete jobs in the creation of cloth. And many of them, if not most of them, had their own guilds in places like London. So did the clothiers coming in and taking a person from one guild and another guild and another guild, did that create problems with the guild? So you're saying that guild rules were kind of an issue and that's why they moved out. But in terms of recruiting people from the guilds was that an issue it it could be an issue yes because as as you say the guilds could have quite a tight tight control over production some clothiers operated very successfully in towns but but others certainly preferred to locate in the countryside where there were less uh, restrictions in in operation so yes, you do you do find examples of um, guilds certainly with quite restrictive practices in place. So is this one of the early places in which people are moving to where the work is? Do you find kind of evidence of people maybe living in one place and being lured by work somewhere else? Is this kind of a something that feeds into mobility at this time? I think it probably is. It's tricky to find a lot of examples of of mobility just because of the, the kind of records that we have. I suppose one important and early example of mobility actually is the movement of certain skilled immigrants into England, particularly from Flanders in the 14th century, encouraged by the crown that is encouraging skilled cloth workers to come over to this country under Edward II and and Edward III uh, coming into England and, and settling there. And traditionally, that was seen as a very important starting point for the English cloth industry. And then in the later 20th century, those claims tended to be dismissed a little. But recent work that's been undertaken, and Milan Pajic's uh, work in particular, looking at the role of uh, Fleming's migrating to England, has shown how important they were in establishing and um, operating cloth making businesses in places like Colchester and Yarmouth and London. And then we also find examples of clothiers moving to to establish their businesses too. Uh, For example, Thomas Spring, the first of Lavenham, uh, seems to have come from County Durham area. And I'm sure that clothiers did move to particular areas where there were already other clothiers and there were trading links and there were established pool of labour too and and, and skilled labour that they could draw on. Yeah, and especially if you had some structure in place, like we're saying environmental structures in place, that would be certainly a reason to move, which is, again, making me think of your comparison to Silicon Valley, right? Yes, I think that... um... I think economists call it um, agglomeration economies, the idea that once you've got a few individuals there with the skills, the know-how, the contacts, it tends to draw other people in too to those same locations and um, they're setting up uh, businesses too, building on the, um, the knowledge and expertise that's already there. But this has been a fascinating discussion and I'm so glad that I emailed you because <laughs> the book was great and this has been really illuminating for me at least and I'm really so pleased that you came on to talk to us about Clothier. So thank you so much, John. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. To find out more about John's work, you can visit his page at the University of York Centre for Medieval Studies at york.ac.uk slash medieval dash studies slash our dash research slash research dash staff slash John Lee. His book, which I highly recommend, is The Medieval Clothier, published by Boydell Press. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's going on, Peter? Hey, hey. Well, this week we have the Byzantine and Friends podcast. It's run by Anthony Cadellis, and it's a, a really great episode this week talking about Byzantine tales of horror. So uh, what he did was he been uh, finding various kind of texts that have some sort of spooky or uh, uh, weird quality that he's found over the years. He's put them all together 
um, where various people have written out. Um, so you can get here by like murders or demonic visitations, the undead, all it was a really wonderful kind of uh, New Year's Eve uh, type piece. Uh, so I, if you if you love listening to podcasts, check that one out. It's about an hour and a half long. So it's it's a it's really lengthy, but it's really great tales. Um, so we have that. Uh, another th- thing is uh, Benet Lorza is now uh, on his uh, Scandinavian uh, theme, where he's actually going to be talking about the Kalmar Union, uh, which starts up in the 14th century. So this is kind of uh, when Scandinavia all got together as one. So uh, so check that out on the site. That sounds awesome. Thanks, Peter. Thanks. There are only a couple of days left to sign up for my brand new medieval masterclass for creators. It's a six-week online class which features six experts who walk you through everything from cooking to blacksmithing and even the textiles we were just talking about. With our video classes, you can see colors, textures, and techniques giving you the information you need to create your medieval fiction, whether it's a comic book, a video game, or a romance novel. You also get access to manuscript images, photos of artifacts, a bibliography, a community of fellow creators, and access to me for all your most thorny questions. Class starts January 8th, so get on it! You can find all the information and sign up at MedievalMasterclass.com. Thank you, as always, to our patrons on Patreon.com for your loyalty and support. Patrons of the Medieval Podcast get access to all sorts of goodies like subscriptions to Medieval Warfare magazine and the Medieval magazine, membership in our book club, and our original maps by Tina Ross. To find out more about how to become a patron, visit patreon.com slash medievalists. For everything from clothing to crusades, follow medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at medievalists. You can follow me, Danielle Sabalski, across social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books, including Life in Medieval Europe, Fact and Fiction, at your favorite online bookstores. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Guy Frog. Thanks for listening. Have a fun and fashionable day. <laughs> <laughs>